may have heard of Web 3.0, but what is it and what makes it different from Web 1.0 and 2.0? Is it just a fancy name for blockchain and cryptocurrencies, or is there something deeper at play here? Well, in this explainer video, we'll try to answer all your questions about Web 3.0. Before we jump in, let me just explain that Web 3.0 does not have a specific definition. Instead, it's a concept, and it's seen as the next evolution of the internet. Now, to fully understand Harry Potter and the Prisoners of Azkaban, we need to recap on what happened in the first and the second parts of the movie. Similarly, to understand Web 3.0, we need to take a look at Web 2.0 and Web 1.0. First up, Web 1.0, which started in the 1990s, when we saw the beginning of the digital era. During this time, the internet was primarily used to consume information and news, and people could communicate only via emails. The information you would normally find in a newspaper or in a library was now available online, but there wasn't much you could actually do with it. The pages were static, read-only versions, where users could simply consume the information. Web 2.0, or the social web, arrived at around 2004-2005. With Web 2.0, users no longer just consumed the information, but they were also contributors. With advanced technologies like JavaScript, HTML5 and CSS3, you could now interact with the websites that you visited. You could express your interest to news agencies, media outlets and content creators on the type of content that you wanted to read and consume. You could also share your opinions with the world on your social media profiles and interact with content shared by other users on the web. Web 2.0 brought the power of content creation and interaction to the masses, making it the read-write version of the internet. But this power came at a heavy cost, the centralization of power. As the tech companies like Facebook grew stronger, the balance of power shifted from the web users to the tech giants. Big social media companies started collecting our data in the name of personalizing and improving our experience of using the internet. Although they did improve our web experience, they also started selling our personal data to advertisers for money. For these big companies, we were the products that they sold on the market to make them billions. You must have remembered the time when you were having a chat about the best coffee place with your friend, and then an ad for a coffee place showed up on your Facebook newsfeed. Today, you're constantly being listened to and watched on, and there exists no private web space, even if you use incognito mode. These tech giants also have the power to control. They can stop you from creating an account on their platform or revoke your access if they believe you're not abiding by their terms of use. For example, if they think that you're using bad language or mentioning a topic that they think is controversial. They can also control what you see in your social media profiles and show you what they believe is right for you. Web 2.0 proved to be a huge leap in the development of the web, but it's also consolidated control into the hands of a few major entities who make decisions on your behalf. Web 3.0 can also be known as the read, write, own internet, and it signifies the decentralization of this consolidated power. It takes the power from companies like Facebook and Google and places it into the hands of the user. With Web 3.0, you're not only consumers and contributors, but you're now also decision makers of how you choose to interact with the web. You can now decide what you want to do with your data rather than someone else imposing a decision on you. If you want your data to be sold to advertisers for money, you will be fairly compensated for it rather than the big tech giants pocketing ad revenue. You're also free to turn off ads for your web sessions. And in this case, your data will not be shared with advertisers. Brave Browser is one such example from the real world, where you'll get rewarded in their native crypto token BAT for the ads that you want to watch. Web 3.0 is also permissionless. This means that you can access any decentralized application on the internet using just your wallet. In Web 3.0, no central authority can revoke your access just because they don't like what you're saying or how you're saying it. You also have the power to decide on the governance of some of the platforms that you use. By using decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs, and holding the governance token of the protocol, community members can vote on decisions of how the organizations are run. 
With the decentralization of power through these means, there's no one central party who calls all the shots, but rather the entire network decides what is best for themselves. Now, NFTs, blockchain, and cryptocurrencies are sometimes confused with Web 3.0. However, these are just some of the tools that will be used in this space to regain control of your web experience and to cut out the middleman. With NFTs, for example, you'll regain greater control of your digital assets like artwork, music, and tickets, etc. But it's not just the ownership and the decision-making that is an impressive feature of Web 3.0. Instead, it's a foolproof system with no central point of failure. Let me just explain with an example. Whenever you go onto YouTube to watch a video, you send a data request to a central server on YouTube, which stores all the videos. Once the central server receives your request, it will then find that video from its storage and play it for you on their website. If the central server goes down, you will not be able to access YouTube. And if it gets hacked, all the data stored on the server could get into malicious hands. This happened in October 2021, when Facebook's central server went down and was unavailable for six hours, and the whole world came to a standstill. With a central source, there is a greater chance of network outage or failure. With decentralization in Web 3.0, data is distributed across several servers or nodes, and there's no single point of failure. If one node is hacked or goes down, the system can keep on functioning. Web 3.0 is also constantly improvable. This means that all the code written for a particular application is open source and can be viewed by anyone. Developers and tech experts have the permission to take that code and build something better since it's publicly available. Similar to how Web 1.0 and 2.0 evolved and merged into each other, there's no specific date to when 3.0 will start. Instead, it's just seen as the next evolution of the internet, essentially using blockchain technology. So as you can see, there is a lot of value to Web 3.0, which will change the way we live and interact digitally. It's just starting out, so we should see some massive improvements in the tools and the technologies in the coming years. All in all, helping us to take back control from the world's major firms and allowing us to use the internet on our own terms. To find out more about the world of crypto, please check out our new series of explainer videos and subscribe to our channel by clicking on the bottom at the bottom of this video.